Good day, this is Jim Patel from Columbia Gorge Community College Renewable Energy Technology Program. This is RIT 120 Hydraulics. Today we're going to have a discussion about hydraulic actuators. And at this point, you should be very familiar with hydraulic actuators, at least their external workings. So uh, what we're going to do is we're going to put on our 3D x-ray vision glasses again and just go internally to what hydraulic actuators are and discuss them in a little bit more further detail. Um, what is a hydraulic actuator? There's a number of different types of actuators uh, and basically all they do is a means of converting fluid power to mechanical power. i.e. you want to push, pull, rotate, do something with it, okay? So uh, there's three types, there are, there's two really major types, there's a super minor thing. Um, cylinders, we should be intimately familiar with. Two motors, hydraulic motors. And this third thing is an oscillator. So cylinders, they produce linear mechanical energy or power. Um, I'm going to put that in quotation marks too. Linear. Um, because the way they are mounted can sometimes produce rotational um, or tipping um, type of uh, movements. But the cylinders themselves produce linear mechanical power. Uh, a motor is rotational. You know, zero, two, three, sixty, and keeps on going. You know, it's rolling in a circle. Whereas an oscillator, it's a fixed arc. It's kind of like rotational, but it's a fist, a fixed arc. You know, it's going from, let's say, negative thirty degrees to thirty degrees. If that was zero degrees, and it's going back and forth, back and forth, you know, to maybe shake something. You might not see an oscillator, but you probably will see, you'll definitely see cylinders. You probably might see um, hydraulic motors. There's obviously uh, schematic symbols for these things. A double acting cylinder, which we've seen a lot. A hydraulic motor, if a pump, has an energy triangle going out of it, and that's a bi-directional pump. And we'll go into what a hydraulic motor is. It's basically a pump run in reverse. If pumps have energy triangles going out of them, hydraulic motors have them coming into them. So that's a bi-directional hydraulic motor. An oscillator, like I said, it's kind of a fixed arc. And so the schematic symbol uh, for an oscillator, appropriately enough, is an arc with those. Chances are these are the two the guys that you'll see the most. OK, so let's go into the uh, internal workings, uh, well, internal construction of our first guy, uh, namely our cylinder. Okay, so what I've done is got an exploded diagram here of a cylinder. And this is what it looks like in the center, uh, in the inside of it. Basically, got our cap end plate. Cap end port. You know, a port, basically, that's where the fluid comes in. The cylindrical housing. That's known as the barrel. This guy right there slides in and out of the barrel. That's our piston. Our rod that threads into our piston, and that's going to actually extend out of our rod end plate. And how do we get fluid into and out of our rod end? Our rod end port. Okay, so now when you stick these guys together, this is the question to ask yourself. What moves 
relative, what part moves relative to another? What part is fixed relative to another? Okay, so when we stick our cap end plate next to our barrel, is that ever going to move? The answer is, is no. That is a static union between our cap end plate and our barrel. So that's a static, it's known as a static seal. Those parts do not move relative to each other. Okay, so you can pretty much put in, you know, it's 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 going to be a positive seal. Uh, they don't move relative to each other. But does the piston and the barrel, do the piston and barrel, do they move? Yes, they do. Because if we were thinking about the cross section here, here's our cross section of our barrel. The piston's inside it, sliding up and down that thing. That's what's known as a dynamic seal. Static seals, they're super easy to make. For all that matter, you could cast this thing out of aluminum, a single piece of aluminum with a cap end plate and barrel like all together, all one piece. You could weld it together. It's a static seal, it doesn't move. Dynamic seals, dynamic seals, you have to create a positive seal on relatively moving parts. Okay, so basically you do not want leakage from this side to that side, but it still needs to be able to move. Okay, this is how you do a dynamic seal. Let's zoom in on this guy here. Notice how there's a line on that thing? Basically, there's a little indentation here on that piston edge, you know, if I was to tilt this thing more three-dimensionally, it would almost look like this. I don't know if I'm doing it justice. So there's kind of like a little valley in there. And inside that valley, to blow that up even further, here's our barrel. What's placed inside that valley is an O-ring with appropriate enough the cross-section of the letter O. And that provides a seal between our cap end and our rod end. Well, not really. The O-ring it's there, it's going to prevent that leakage back and forth between them. But there's also this thing called a piston ring or a backup ring sometimes. And because this thing is moving back and forth this way, you'll typically have two sets of those. So it's a sandwich of basically rings and our backup ring, piston ring, with your O ring in between. So Basically, piston ring, O-ring, piston ring, wrapped around that groove in there, basically providing us with a positive seal between the cap end and rod end. Is that touching and scraping along here? No, it's not. There is still a film of oil there. And this is one of the questions that people ask me a lot in these earlier hydraulic courses is why do we use hydraulic oil? Uh, why don't we fill up these cylinders with water? Why don't we fill them up with horchata? Um, the simple answer is it's because it's freaking oil. <laughs> you know, that's my answer. That's why we use oil because it's oil. Uh, what does oil do? Basically, it lubricates uh, moving surfaces, and that's exactly what you've got here. Um, this is. This is the other quick experiment. Go home and do this. Take two buckets, fill one up with water, fill one up with motor oil, and stick your both hands inside these things. And your hand's going to get wet, but it's going to drip off. Your hand's going to get oily, and it's going to drip off, but it's going to stay 
oily a lot longer than your other hand stays wet. Okay, and that's a really neat property of oil. Basically, a sticky, a, a thin film is going to stick to that substance, and it requires those dynamic seals require that thin film of oil. I don't want to go into a discussion about physics about oil on surfaces because it is some crazy, cool, cool stuff that happens. You know, basically, um, I just want to talk about it a little bit. Maybe I will go into it. Um, it's neat to see some of the physics that occurs when uh, an object is sliding on a film of oil. Basically, it creates kind of like this, this wedge layer where this layer is stuck to this thing. You know, it's stuck to the surface, preventing that surface from binding with this surface right here. And it's neat, this moving wedge layer there provides this interface between them so they can move relative to each other and create basically a positive, i.e. no leak, seal, even though they are uh, moving. Pretty cool, huh? Um, super high pressure applications, you may not see one set of piston rings, you might see several piston rings on there. You know, here's a piston ring, and if you're going to go ahead and install several piston rings in there, back to back, make sure the ends are opposing. Okay, so that way there's no leak between that spot there, because basically that is taken up by that one. Okay, then there's our O-ring, and then there's our other double set of uh, backup rings there. Okay, uh, O-rings, are they the only shape? No, there's a bunch of different ones. Um, cup V's, cup U's, uh, this is a good one, the quad ring. Because an O-ring, you know, as it's sliding, it might get distorted. Um and maybe pinched. The quad rings are pretty neat in the fact that uh, these little legs here kind of stabilize that. So um, those are found in dynamic seals. Whereas a static seal, uh, you might have some O-rings in there, but typically what you might see is a gasket. It's basically a pre-cut seal uh, made out of some um, basically malleable, so a pre-cut seal. It's a malleable, I'm just going to say the word malleable because I don't know how to spell it, malleable uh, object that can be compressed into imperfections. Basically, you can compress it into imperfections. So let's say here is our static seal. Where's our static seal? Well, obviously our cap end plate with our barrel, obviously our rod end plate with our barrel. I'm going to go back to the rod end port here for a second. Um, so let's say, let's see our a microscopic view. Here is the imperfections on the cap end plate. Here's the imperfections on the barrel. What it is, you've got this soft material, a gasket that's placed in between, and you compress these two guys together. And that gasket material is compressed into the imperfections, performing a static seal. You know, a soft metal or plastic, elastic plastics and elastomers. Um, super common one. P T F E polytetrafluoroethylene, better known as Teflon. Um, low friction, super clean and chemically stable. Uh, you'll especially see Teflon um, seals in the uh, semiconductor industry. They're uh, non-polluting, well, non-particle um, causing. Um, there's polyurethane, hard and strong, but it's pretty vulnerable to hot water, of all things. Uh, nitriles, NBRs, fluorocarbons, uh, Viton, they're all different types of materials. Um, Viton is used for higher temperatures than nitrile. But uh, let's go back to a certain dynamic seal. So obviously there's a dynamic seal between the piston edges and the barrel. What's our next dynamic seal? Well, where the rod comes out of the rod end plate. Okay, there's obviously a dynamic seal there. 
So here's our rod ends plate, and our rod has to go through there. So there's going to be a dynamic seal there. And our rod is passing out into what? Into the atmosphere, into the room, into, in the case of a heavy earth moving equipment, an extremely dirty environment. That rod that you see really is the same rod that's inside, that's bathed inside the oil on the rod end. So can anybody see a problem with this? Well, especially for the heavy earth moving equipment, what's out here? Particles, rocks, dirt, oil, all that stuff. So um, you don't want to bring that in when you retract that thing. So how do you get rid of that? There's this thing called, in addition to the dynamic seal, there's this thing here called a rod wiper. And it's a couple objects that basically scrape the dirt off before it hits the set of o-rings here so as that rod retracts it's scraping all that dirty stuff off so those o-rings don't have to contend it contend with it that's called a rod wiper so where does that go in our diagram right there rod wiper Okay, so that's the basic materials uh, that make up our linear actuators, our cylinders. And now let's just talk about some uh, modifications to our plain old vanilla cylinder. Okay, we already talked about a rod wiper. Um, what if it's a super, super dirty environment? You know, here's our cylinder. Here's that rod that's constantly extending itself and then retracting itself from a dirty environment. Um, you just put a fabric bellows over it. That's called a bellows. You'll see those, especially on heavy earth moving equipment. Basically, it's just some tough fabric cover trying to limit the amount of dirt that's falling on the rods. By the way, let's say, for example, you're done for the day, uh, you're done for the week, you're done for the weekend, whatever it is. When you're storing your equipment, do you store rods extended or rods retract? retracted? The answer is retracted. Why do you store rods retracted? Well, to prevent all that dust from settling on that rod, which will eventually be retracted into the rod end. So always store your equipment with the rods retracted. Okay, so a bellows is a modification uh, to prevent that. Um, what about uh, a super long cylinder? You know, here's a big cylinder with a big rod, and it's, let's do this more appropriately. At an, uh, horizontally, you extend this guy all the way out. What's gonna happen? I mean, think about that. Stand there with a two by four and extend it all the way out. What's gonna happen? It's going to start sagging there. So to prevent that, there's something called a stop tube sometimes. Well, so what a stop tube is, something internal to the rod end that's placed inside that's inside the barrel. So what happens is, in a cross section, here is the stop tube, here's the barrel. When it gets to, when it's extending, all the stop tube does is make sure that it can't extend it all the way. And it would sag, and the problem with the sagging, it's not so much the sagging, it's the, uh, inadvertently kinking that piston there and eventually jamming it. You know, so basically, all a stop tube does is make sure that there's a little bit of the rod in there, sufficient amount of area contacting so it doesn't kink and bend like that. Okay, um, we've thus far talked about uh, 
double active cylinders quite a lot with a single rod. Here's a neat thing. What if I had a piston face with a rod at one end and a rod at the other? Pretty cool, huh? So that's again inside a barrel housing. You know, and I've got a, <laughs> I don't know what to call that. They're both rod end ports. Uh, that's known as a double rod. Obviously, why is it called a double rod? It's got two rods. Uh, schematic symbol for that guy. So what is a double rod? It's basically, it's the same force as extension or retraction. That's a pretty neat thing because this area is the same on both sides of that piston face. So same force, extension or retraction. The other thing that's cool is I can push on this side while I'm pulling on that side. Let's say you've got an assembly line structure. All you do is push this way, pull that way, and then you go the other way. Now I'm pushing this way. I'm pulling that way. And if you stagger your workflow, you could do that uh, with a single cylinder. So that's a pretty neat application for a double rod. Um, what if I was to take a double acting cylinder and take another double acting cylinder with a hole in the back? So the rod from this one could extend through into there. You understand what I'm saying? So this rod is pushing on this guy's cap face. That's what's known as a tandem. What's neat about that is hook both these cap ends to pressurize flow. I've got pressure here providing force to this piston face. And additionally, I've got pressurized flow on that piston face. So a tandem is without using a giant big barrel cylinder with a single face there, where I might not have an application or I might not have a space to fit that thing. I could use a tandem cylinder where this back cylinder is pushing on the piston face of that guy. So a tandem, um, they're connected. You might also hear, hear the term duplex. It's the same thing as a tandem, except they're not connected. I, you can take this cylinder apart from that cylinder. Um, they do the same thing. You can basically duplex, you can break it apart. Whereas a tandem, it's that's one object. Okay, uh, a couple other modifications to our cylinders. Um, what happens when we get to the limits of our travel? I uh, are pushing our on the cap end here, pressurized flow enters there. It's going to extend. What happens right there? Bang. It slams into the rod end plate. And that's not exactly a desirable occurrence. So what people do is put a cushion there. What is this cushion? This is a cushion on extension. And if I was put one here, that's a cushion on retraction. If they're both there, cushion on extension and retraction. And what is a cushion? Uh, what it is, it's uh, basically a flow control valve, if you could think of it this way, is it's a flow control valve that's only active at the very limits of travel. So from here all the way up to let's say a quarter inch it's going as fast as it possibly can and at that last section there it starts decelerating the extension of this rod via one of two means either a fixed those are by the way are fixed versus a 
adjustable cushion. Okay, so uh, you know, let's say I extend it out, and I say, oh, that's slamming too hard. If I have an adjustable cushion on extension, I can slow it down ever so slightly. That last little section there. So um, let's describe it this way. Uh, here, here's a here's a variable one. So here's something. Let's do a in the barrel. And here's my piston as it's coming down. And the piston's got this plug on it. And it's not affecting the, the area on it because, again, it's acting, pressure's acting on this area, this area, which is the same as a regular piston face. So it's not adjusting the force there. But what happens at this thing here? Basically, as this area, whoops, here's my port. This fluid is leaving here. Once this plug hits here, it's sealing that off. Okay, so fluid can't flow through that passageway, that big passageway anymore. But what there is, is basically a tiny flow control valve right there. That if it's adjustable, you can adjust it. So what's neat is basically up until this plug here engages, it's going out as whatever flow rate that you've got set for it. And until this plug seals right here, then that flow control valve determines the flow rate for this tiny little bit of fluid right there, which slowly descends that down and so it doesn't slam into, in this particular case, our cap end plate. It's just a pretty neat way of, at the very limits of extension, it's just going to slow itself down. You know, rather than slamming into a parking spray place with your, uh, with your parking brake, what you're doing is you're gently applying the brakes, going to a reasonable speed, and then stopping. Okay, so just slowly putting on the brakes. Um, the uh, cylinder mounting methods. That's another thing that, like I said before, what does a cylinder produce? It produces linear, quotation marks, mechanical power. When I say linear, the mounting methods determine how that linear energy is used. Pretty obviously, there's some fixed mounts that it's going to be linear. Here is So it's known as lugs. Coming off those cap and rod end plates. Those are lugs. So basically, it's attached to some object via some bolts that go through those lugs. And that cylinder goes in and out linearly. Uh, I'm going to draw the rest of these here. Here, I don't waste your time watching me draw these things. OK, so here's the four main uh, fixed methods of mounting. First one is obviously our lugs. Next one is a flange uh, to mount that thing vertically. Uh, the flush, um, basically, it's a side mount here. You know, you, the bolts are extending. The mounting bolts are extending from the cap and rod end plates rather than having the ears like the lugs and the flange. Uh, the fourth fixed method is via tie rods where the tie rods go through here to mount. And those fixed mounting methods are in direct contrast to the two major pivot mounting methods. First one is a clevis. Don't be the dude that shows up at an interview and says, Oh, I use, I've used clevis mounts before. Okay, basically, it's just got this little ear that's sticking off of it. Basically, now this cylinder itself is free to move. Even though the, the force here is linear, the cylinder is free to move.
Another super common method is a trunnion. So a trunnion has basically these two cylindrical protrusions. There's another one on this side. That stick out. And again, that guy is free to rotate in this method. It doesn't have to be on either the uh, cap or rod end ports. You could also see trunnions sticking off this side. So again, the cylinder is free to rotate. Um, super common. Uh, cylinders are used to rotate the pitch of a wind turbine blade. You, one would think, okay, hey, it's a rotational energy, so one would use a uh, hydraulic motors. Nope, it is a cylinder that does that. How it does that is the use of a trunnion mount. So, for example, here is inside the pitch inside a blade, inside the hub of a wind turbine. And so let's say here's our blade, there's full power. No wind's coming from this direction. Here's no power. To pitch that thing, what it is internally, basically it's a cylinder on a trunnion mount that can extend and retract, and very similar to the, uh, you know, because that thing can go up and down like this. It can roll this way because of that trunnion mount. And as that cylinder extends, it's going to roll the wheel this way, and as it retracts, it's going to roll the wheel that way, depending on where it's mounted. Um, the nearest analogy I could, uh, visual analogy I could have for this one is, remember the old school locomotives? You know, basically that's a, a cylinder, um, a steam-driven cylinder that's going in and out, providing rotational energy to that wheel. Um, and we're just using it in a more modern form. It's a cylinder and a trunnion mount that rolls that uh, that blade. Okay, so uh, I think we have exhausted uh, everything. No, we have not. Oh my gosh, I have not even mentioned the single acting cylinder. We've talked and talked and talked about the double acting cylinder. Let's revisit our single acting cylinder, our RAM. So a single acting cylinder, one port in and out. Okay, so one might ask is if I've put pressurized flow in, how do I get it to come out? Well, typically single acting cylinders have a weight on them. The weight itself actually forces that fluid out when we put it in this manner, okay? So uh, there's a vent on those, the air vent, or the rod is as big as the barrel. So that way there's no need to air vent that. That's a ram, single acting or ram cylinder. Um, you might also see them with a if it's if it's mounted horizontally, single acting cylinder, you might see a spring retract. Basically, the spring forces it back. Um, a telescoping ram, the classic garbage truck. Basically, these rods extend in sections. Um, Again, how do you get that to retract? The weight of the bed is enough to retract that if you are allowing that pressure to go to tank as opposed to from the pump. Okay? That's about it for cylinders. Let's go on to motors which again, hydraulic motors convert hydraulic energy into rotational mechanical energy. Um, there's a bunch of different types of hydraulic motors, just the same as, as there is a bunch of different types of pump. Uh, we have talked about gear pumps, vein pumps, and piston pumps. And a hydraulic motor is very similar to a hydraulic pump in the fact that there's gear motors, vein motors, and piston motors. Uh, bent axis, uh, fixed axis, uh, piston pumps, all sorts of that. There's a direct correlation between the two because really all hydraulic motor is, 
it's a pump driven in reverse. So for example, here is our gear pump or is it a gear motor? So if this shaft is being turned by something in this direction, what it's doing, it's taking fluid and driving it in this direction. But now my question to you is, if pressurized fluid flow is coming from this direction to this direction, what is happening to those gears? Well, they're spinning. So attach the shaft on the backside to some load that you want to spin. You have a hydraulic motor. So like I said before, a pump has the energy triangle going out of it. Hydraulic motor has the energy triangles going into it. In this particular case, it's bi-directional because I can change the fluid flow direction. All I do is I change the direction of rotation of that hydraulic motor. Okay. Um, you know, again, pressurized fluid flow turns the gears and the keyed gear is attached to a shaft, which produces torque. And what torque is, is basically twisting force. Typically measured in Newton meters in the SI system, foot pounds in the Neanderthal system, or inch pounds, depends. Same thing, it's basically a unit of length and a unit of force. And, you know, classic example is, um, you know, your standing over a cliff with a stick that's 12 inches long and you get a hundred pound weight hanging from it so that's 100 foot pounds of torque because yeah, that's 12 inches is one foot 100 foot pounds of torque now to take that same 100 because it's again it's trying to twist in that direction. So that same 100 pounds, put it on a stick that's 48 inches long. You know, obviously a little bit harder to hold because that's 400 foot pounds of torque twisting that thing. I know that's a simple example. It's, it's a rotational force. Um, you guys are going to go over this in mechanics. So um, the that's what it's producing, obviously. And that is, obviously, if that's the force, you know, you could think of torque as basically, it's, it's a twisting force. And like I said before, is pressure is equivalent to speed. So if I increase the pressure available to a hydraulic motor, I increase the torque it's capable of delivering. Okay. And now conversely, if I increase the flow rate to any linear actuator, which we've discussed a lot, I increase its speed. So if I increase the flow rate to a hydraulic motor, what do I do? I increase its speed, obviously, but because it's rotational, what I do is I increase its RPM. Okay, so let's put those two summary. Pressure, increase pressure, I increase torque. If I increase flow rate, I increase its speed. Basically, I increase its RPM, revolutions per minute, its rotational speed, sometimes called N. Um, very similar to a for example, let's stick with our example, our gear pump. It's a f This particular model is a fixed displacement, because all gear pumps are, it's a fixed displacement hydraulic motor. And let's say it produces, it has a displacement of one cubic inch, one cubic inch per revolution. Okay, so anytime, uh, oops, I'll just write that way. Per
her rev. I can figure out how fast, how many RPMs that are going when I put in a certain flow rate. So that's my displacement. So if I want to determine my RPM, I take basically my flow rate in gallons per minute. I got to go ahead, because typically it's expressed in cubic inches. Multiply it by 231 cubic inches per gallon. Divide it by my displacement. So let's say one gallon per minute. Gallon per minute, that's 231 cubic inches. If I'm replace, if I'm doing so. Per revolution, per minute, I gotta keep my unit straight. Basically, I'm getting 231 revolutions per minute because that revolutions is going to go up top there. Keep it just crosses out revolutions per minute, okay? Just like we did with our. Uh, pumps given a certain amount of revolutions and a displacement per revolution we can determine our flow rate now given a displacement per revolution and given a flow rate determine the revolutions okay that's exactly what a hydraulic motor is supposed to do it's supposed to rotate and provide some torque okay so uh like i mentioned before is pressure and torque here's a formula that basically the amount of torque produced so your pressure times your displacement, i.e. that same cubic inches per, because it's rotational, 2 pi. And by the way, that's in uh, inch pounds. And a uh, quick, uh, quick thing, foot pounds, that's torque. Pounds F, what's that mean? It's not foot pounds. Pounds force. Because pounds, unfortunately, in our vernacular, people think that's mass. That's that's not correct. It's weight. Pounds is force. Pounds is force. Pounds is equivalent to a Newton, you know, well, quasi equivalent to a Newton. That's a force. Pounds force. Um, the unit of mass in the SI system is kilogram. Unit of mass, the amount of substance something has in SI or in uh, English system, that's believe it or not, that's called a slug. So that's you're not going to see that one often. But this right here, pounds F, is not foot pounds; it's pounds force. So remember that you're going to see that on certain gauges. Foot pounds, that's torque. And as much as I don't like to do this, I'm actually just going to give you some useful formulas. Uh, and just kind of just present them to you um, to determine some really quick formulas here. Uh, just determine, okay, do I have the right motor for the right job? Um, obviously, horsepower is a, because there's a lot of units here, basically, that's why I don't want to get into a uh, big discussion about these uh, foot pounds versus inch pounds. Obviously, 12 inch pounds is equal to one foot pound. There's a bunch of conversions. So if you're just given, uh, let's say, let's determine, we want to determine horsepower and we're given flow rate and pressure. How do we determine that? Basically, and again, that's gallons per minute. Pressure is PSI. We're given these two. We want to determine horsepower, which remember is 550 foot pounds per second. With all those unit conversions in there, basically you get, oops, I already started writing it. These are original QMP numbers times 231 times 6012, oh, six times 12 foot pounds per second, which simplifies 
two, I think it's about 1541. Let me look that up. Nope, that's our point three two zero eight number. So there's just some of these magic numbers that come up here that sometimes it does help to actually just have the formula. Foot pounds per second. Now again, that's foot pounds per second. Again, what is a horsepower? One horsepower well, is equivalent to 550 foot pounds per second. So there's a conversion there. And basically that is going to give us this magic number right here, 1714. QP. I think I already went over this in uh, one of the earlier um, lectures here. Again, it's just it's nice to have one of those skip formulas so you don't get bogged up in all these conversions right here. Uh, I'll just give you another one here. Uh, what's the the motor horsepower? So here's a hydraulic motor horsepower because sometimes you're not given flow rate and pressure. Um, you're just given uh, observable quantities. Um, you're given the RPMs N, and you're given the torque in inch pounds. So rather than measuring flow rate and pressure, you can just measure RPM and torque produced. Basically take N T divided by 63025, which actually happens to be a zip code, um, I think in Missouri, for a manufacturer of hydraulic motors, which I thought is really cool. That's just a straight conversion there. So again, you can do it either two ways. You get your horsepower using Q and P, or you can get your horsepower for using RPMs and the torque in inch pounds and divided by 63025. Ultimately, you should get the same answer given if you're observing a flow rate and pressure and RPM and torque, you should come up with the same horsepower. Um, typically, you're going to measure either one or the other. Okay, that pretty much is it for uh, hydraulic actuators. Just be aware, too, that there is something out there called an oscillator, which is basically a reduced arc of rotation. Um, think about it like a rack and pinion uh, for a uh, steering wheel. It's not like you're going to spin your wheels all the way around. You're basically, uh, if you're looking at your hood, you're moving them in an arc. That's similar to an oscillator. Um, cylinders, linear motion, and I say linear with quotation marks because depending upon how you mount them, you can actually use them to get rotational, uh, at least in an arc method. Um, and the hydraulic motor is basically producing mechanical power in a rotational uh, direction. That's about it for actuators.